Okay. What's up, guys? I am on a reactionary streak. I am on... I'm... Doing this. Can't call it up. Um, I, uh... This is, uh... Ren's, um... Chapter 5. That we're gonna get into. Um, him talking about, um... His, uh... The Ren uh, autobiography of his um, sickness, treatment, illness, um, his time in uh, music and industries, and uh, just uh, just the Ren uh, the Ren saga that we've got coming up. Um, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and listen to Ren, and I'm gonna chime in um, with a little bit of my own uh, commentary as far as my uh, my struggle with my with 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 my Lyme disease, um, and. Um, and then we're going to watch this video um, at the end. You don't have to. You know, I mean, you can go do something else if you have something else to do going on. But um, that's what I'm going to do. So anyway, you guys can join me. Um, I've been getting very medicated today. So things are looking very, very up. Um, and might be a good day. Might be a profitable, uh, productive day. Even though it's cold outside and a little wet. A little rainy. The weather here is not too great right now. So not much to do outside. So, um, all right, here we go. Chapter 5. Take it away, Red. I tried to cling on to music and whatever ways I could during the time I was sick. During my time in Brighton, whenever my energy would allow it, I'd get myself out onto the streets and I'd go busking about once every three weeks or so. It was my second year in Brighton, and I remember one evening heading home with my guitar and my busking amp after a couple of hours of playing on the street. I remember hearing this amazing ethereal voice while heading through the lanes, and I saw that it was coming from this 16-year-old kid. I've always had a deep admiration and feeling of camaraderie for buskers. There's something about the willingness to be able to bear your soul to a street full of strangers that really moves me. I noticed that the kid didn't have an amp. He was singing totally a cappella, but you'd only hear him if you were within a few metres of him. I knew from years on the street and singing a cappella than myself that an amp can change everything. I had this compulsion to offer him mine. I approached him and I told him that if he plugged in and sang while I played guitar, the whole street would stop in its tracks. And I was right. His voice soared across the street and people started stopping. Not long after we had the whole street's attention, something quite magic was happening. This was the first day that I met Sam Tompkins, someone who would be integral to my whole life changing later on. He had a friend with him this guy called Connor Honeyset, who would later go on to be my manager. For now, they'd just be a couple of teenagers that I'd have to help out on my way home. It's funny how life works like that. I kept up to date with what Sam was doing on social media. There was a part of me that felt like his successes allowed me to live vicariously through someone else who lived an alternate reality where I never got sick. He was getting videos on SBTV, writing and featuring with some amazing artists, and there were quite a lot of similarities in our writing styles, and all at such a young age. I wasn't really able to do any of that stuff at the time. I was mostly bed bound with the exception of the odd day that I'd be able to go busking. It could have been e very easy for that feeling to turn into jealousy, but it never did. I felt truly proud of him. Years later, we go, go on to write a song together called Blind Eyed, which would transform the trajectory in my whole career. During this time, I was still desperately jumping from one treatment to another treatment. And now that my diet had become more limited, I was trying new diets with no luck. As the options in the alternative health world started to dwindle, I started searching for answers in the divine. In the former years, I had moments where I found myself sitting in churches, talking in tears to whoever might be listening, or experimenting with energetic healing modalities like Reiki. With time, my searching started taking even more unusual turns. I started looking to things like exorcists. Once you exhaust all rational explanations and treatments, the irrational suddenly starts looking more palatable. I had a skeptic's mind, but I had nothing to lose because there were no other good options. My friend Momoko's mother was from Japan. She aligned herself with a sect of Buddhism called the Nichiren Daishonin. They would chant a repeated phrase over and over again while holding prayer beads. The chant would go, Nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo, over and over again. Its intention was to align you with your innate Buddhahood, to cleanse you of any bad karma and put you in alignment with your true destiny on earth, to find peace, to find tranquility. 
Momoko's mom gifted me with my own set of beads and I, be and I began to chant every morning. Eventually I joined a group in Brighton after a serendipitous meeting with an incredibly eccentric, bright colourful suit wearing piano tuner. He spotted my beads and he grinned at me and he pulled out his own. We'd sit in a small group and we'd chant for hours sometimes. There was something comforting about trusting the course of my life and illness to an incomprehensible power outside of myself. I spoke openly in these meetings that I loved feeling part of something, but that I really struggled, saying with certainty that I believed in it. This was the issue I faced with every religion I temporarily aligned myself with looking for answers. I, something in me couldn't bring myself to take ancient texts as gospel, all too aware of how man twists so-called spiritual doctrines to suit his own power-hungry pursuits. I wanted divine proof. I sometimes screamed at the sky or the waves and begged for it. I was answered with sickness. If there was a creator, I was angry with it. The irony was that I envied people of faith. I felt like people who truly trusted themselves to a higher power seemed to possess a level of calm and acceptance that I didn't. One of my stranger encounters was going to see a shaman. The shaman, of course, was a middle-aged white woman in a quite nice looking cottage in Brighton. She told me to lie down and she proceeded to lean over my body and made noises like coughing up phlegm while speaking an unknown ancient language that seemed to include whistling noises. After about 20 minutes of making distressed groaning noises over my back, she paused in contemplation for a while and proceeded to tell me that I'd been killed by a sword in my past life. She made sucking noises near the supposed stab site on my chest and then she spat into a bucket. She then placed a little stone into my hand and she told me that I had to bury it on a high hill in Brighton on the next full moon. The most depressing part of this story is during the next full moon, I did indeed find a big hill, dug a small hole and I buried the stone in it. Surprising to say, fuck all happened. It was this journey into the spiritual unknown that led me to a very unsettling experience. I located a therapist online who had claimed to overcome Emmy herself. She specialised in it and dealt with people's past trauma, but also worked with energies like Reiki. I had to get the train to where she lived. She met me in the car and drove me in silence back to hers. There was a bit of an unusual energy about her. I've always been really good at reading people. I can't quite explain it, but sometimes when I meet someone, it's like I have a sixth sense for whether or not they'll play a significant role in my life. This person's energy felt alien to me. When we arrived at her, she told me that she sometimes would consult with her horses about people's health conditions. It was at this moment I knew that she was probably insane. Nonetheless, I shared a lot about my life. We got into the trauma of living with sickness, what it was like to constantly mourn your own life. It was comforting at first, and it felt like a safe space until it got a bit weird. One day, she offered me a glass of water before a Reiki session, and during the session, I fell into a deep sleep. When I came around, multiple hours had passed, which was peculiar for me. I usually have issues with sleeping and couldn't drift off, particularly not in unfamiliar environments. She assured me it was total normal and to get plenty of, plenty of water, and I thought nothing of it. Lines started getting somewhat blurry when she'd me invite me for meals with her and her husband. I took it as friendliness, but I noticed that she started messaging me outside of clinic hours. One time I agreed to create music for her in exchange for, in exchange for some extra sessions. Not long after, I started getting strange messages in my Facebook inbox. She started telling me how she knew that all my previous songs had been about her, which they hadn't. When I dismissed this, she would sometimes message me saying that she was out outside of my house, telling me that our souls were bonded and that bad things would happen to me if we weren't together. To put it lightly, I was already in a pretty weird emotional place because of years of sickness. So having someone in a position of trust abuse their position like this shook me and it shook my trust in therapy even more. It shook my trust in people in general. I told her to never contact me again and I blocked her, but she would still occasionally get through on other numbers. One time she'd phoned my mum's house relentlessly. My mum, knowing the details, told her to stop harassing me and threatened to get the police involved after things which went silent. This was also the year that I met my second ever girlfriend, who I'd later be engaged to for a short amount of time. My little sister had already set the relationship up in her mind. She met this girl in Bristol who she got on with super well and somehow she wingmanned me and planted the seed in her brain that she'd be perfect for her older brother, me. My sister's friend had moved to Brighton but I was blissfully unaware of this matchmaking. At this point I was living in a house share in Rose Hill Terrace in Brighton with some lunatics I'd met at Ben's house and Momoko had moved down from Cornwall. The house was only meant for two people but Momoko and I had pretend we were, pretended we were married and pretended that we were going to have a baby to be able to get it. As soon as the deed was signed, we moved in with about five other friends, one living in the living room, one in the attic, one in the study, one in the conservatory. 
It's safe to say rent was pretty fucking cheap. One night my friend Luke was throwing a party and she rocked up with a few of her friends. My sister had pretty good taste in girls and I had a crush on her instantly. At some point in the night we both ended up lying on my bedroom floor on a bunch of sofa cushions while about six other people were sleeping in various places in my room. One somehow in the upper compartment of my wardrobe. True story. She asked me to tell her a bedtime story and I, meant, and I made up the most unhinged story I could think of. By some sort of miracle she found my madness endearing and we ended up kissing a lot and staring into each other's eyes till we fell asleep. It's strange navigating a relationship when you're sick. I couldn't go out to eat at restaurants because I was allergic to everything. I didn't have the energy to do most normal things that couples do. Some days I'd be so full of brain fog that my personality disappeared and it was hard to explain that to someone without them thinking that maybe you were just being a bit off with them. I think losing Joe, losing Callum, losing the record deal, losing my last girlfriend, it had all made me wary of getting attached to good things. Quite a lot of my illness made me feel ugly and it's hard to accept love when you feel ugly. Nonetheless, she did love me, and with time, our relationship grew. It was around this time I was contacted by a woman called Jennifer Breer, an incredibly inspiring woman whose journey seemed to parallel mine. She was an incredibly ambitious PhD student at Harvard who one day was struck down by a mystery illness that confined her to a wheelchair. She spent most of her life tirelessly searching for a way out. She was doing a Kickstarter to raise money to make a film called Canary in a Coal Mine. It would later go on to be renamed Unrest, and it would go on to win multiple awards, and it's still watchable on Netflix to this day. It's an incredibly important and very moving documentary about the horrors of living with Emmy. I recommend everyone checks that out. At the time, I started health blogging. I created a series of video diaries that I named Me vs. Emmy. It would be a video document of my various trials with different alternative treatment approaches and generally a look into the life of someone with a chronic illness. I didn't know it back then, but those videos would save my life. I guess I was occupying a place that was needed as quite quickly many people in the chronic health communities gravitated towards my videos. Every day I'd be sent messages telling the stories of the people who had fallen in between the cracks in the floorboards. There was heartbreaking stories. Stories of frustration and confusion. People mourning the people that used to be. Some who were new to this world. Some who had been there for decades. I tried to help them in whatever way I could. I tried to comfort people. In my own little way I became somewhat of a spokesperson for the voiceless. I felt their pain like it was my own. This new pursuit gave me a sense of purpose that I desperately needed. Without purpose I felt useless. I made a lot of friends and I'd write to them on a daily basis. Some of those friends died. Some of, the, some of those friends that decided to take their lives and they were wicked people I talked to them a lot it was this that ultimately made me decide to stop but that wouldn't be until years later immersing myself in the horrors of this illness and trying to carry some of the weight for the others while I still wasn't strong enough to carry my own eventually took its toll Jen Bria had found my videos and she asked me to make a song for her documentary I was honoured I wrote a song called Patience. I'll leave you with a video taken at the time to finish off this chapter. And I've learned. Wow. Um. It's rough when you losing people. Um. Um. I uh. couple things I want to touch on here which um the uh, uh <laughs> the looking for the for the cures um and you just start going down all these all these internet the reds um trying anything you can to find find relief um all the all the home remedies and, and different things I tried, these concoctions that I, I had to go out and find these weird ingredients. You, know, you start looking for, you know, black seed oils and wheat germs and uh, all these food, all these supplements and, and, and things that you mix together and you get this 
oily concoction, you know, garlic cloves in your ears, and just just these ridiculous things that just never ever did anything, you know. I mean, I, practically ready to make a voodoo doll, but you know, some at some point and start casting spells. Um, this is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless cures. Um, uh, <laughs> the uh, a lot of red flags on that um on that woman um that was uh, trying to help him there. Um, I, I I've been watching the uh, series uh Baby Reindeer on Netflix and um it's uh a little bit about uh some stalking going on in there um. And um, uh, some uh, this is a pretty weird, weird series. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, I've never, never had to deal with some uh, no extreme stalking, uh, a little bit. Um, but um, I was able to end that pretty quick. Um, uh, that I've, I've seen that movie Unrest. Um, I looked it up when I found out that he uh, he was in it, and I uh, had a, had a song on the on the soundtrack. Um, and um, I the, the movie I, I was the movie shocked me. I had no idea. Um, with my battle with the chronic fatigue is, um, I mean, it's kept me in bed for you know, let's say maybe a week maybe one period where I spent like well I want to say I spent two weeks in in bed but it was more like I spent two months in, in, a, in a limbo state where I just didn't get anything done um, other than watch a lot of Netflix and Amazon and, and YouTube um, and uh, I don't even think I played any any games but I just had this I don't know two three months long period where I just didn't want to do anything and um, usually comes after the holidays Christmas um, pretty fractured fractured family at this point but but the, the, that movie unrest floored me I I mean there were people that were just completely incapacitated and stuck in a in bed. I mean, like they were in a in a woke a, a waking coma. Um, they, I mean, they were awake, but they were unable to move and get up. And I mean, I was just shocked by that. Um, that movie really. Really open my open my eyes to how how bad some people have this. Um, I consider myself extremely lucky um, in the extent that I have it, but yet uh, I hate I hate every night. Um, like I said uh, earlier, I didn't I didn't sleep at all last night. I've just been awake, I've just been bouncing from room to room bed to the computer watched a lot of YouTube videos tried playing a racing game that I'm really bad at um so uh we didn't get very far in that but um watched, watched a few movies yeah, watched the contestant that uh movie with the with the guy that spent I uh, spent a year and and three months in a uh, locked in a not locked he wasn't locked in a room but he spent a year and three months in a in a room and lived off of magazine prize giveaways which I didn't even know were a thing really um but um uh, a strange movie good movie but um just weird just weird those God, Come up with some, some weird ideas, but um, and, and I kind of equated that. I, I, but I, uh, I don't 
a lot of I knew what he was feeling about though because like when, when when you have this illness you feel like you're locked you're, you're locked in a room you know it's, it's it's not always it's not always a physical room it's a mental room and, and you're locked in there and you and you can't you can't get out um uh in one of the previous chapters Ren saying that you know he felt like he was watching himself from from outside of his body you know and that it wasn't you know he was seeing it but he couldn't like like with my brother I could tell that I was I was letting him down and then I was you know I wasn't he was upset and I could see all the things that I was doing and I could I could see all the all the things I was missing and and I was and I could acknowledge them but I couldn't do anything to change it you know and um, I mean, even this day, you know, even with my mom, she'll, t you know, she'll tell you, you know, she's like, hey, you know, let's go do lunch, you know, uh, and I'm like, um, no, I'm not, I'm not in mental space to go, um, so, um, yeah, that's, um, there you go, all right, it's too much jibber jabber on my end again, <sighs> well, a lot of caffeine, a lot of caffeine. So anyway, let's go ahead and check out the song, um, and then um, uh, you guys, I want you guys to get out of here and get something done today, okay? Stop sitting here. Listen to me. So you're wasting your time. Some lessons that will be so valuable for, for like, so it's a blessing and a curse being this old because it's completely changed me, like, it, it's, it's turned me from a little cocky teenager into into somebody who's quite um, this I guess prepared for things now. Like, like I feel like once I've gone through this, I throw anything at me and it'll be okay. But um, at the same time, as much as I I, I see it as a blessing, I hate it. <laughs> I do hate it. I think it was Thomas Edison that was like, I haven't. Um, failed I've just found a, a thousand things that don't work which is kind of nice to look at it that way like I'm just eliminating things um, but it really challenges my mind and yeah it's just gotten to the point where I'm spending I say like 95% of my life in a bedroom which kind of sucks because my mind is in such a different place in my body my mind craves life <laughs> so much so right it's okay I'm feeling brave, gonna face this day It's okay, it's alright No tears will kiss my cheeks tonight And it's all good, and I'm just fine My words ring out like hollow shells Just slow down, it takes time But time moves slow, I know this well And my heart breaks one thousand times a day But for every hope that dies Another one takes its place because I have the strength of a mountain And I've got the courage of the deep blue sea And I have the heart of a lion And the stars burn bright inside of me And although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see That I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me I know that cause I've been here for some time But all that prepares me for a day when I can truly shine Cause I've been so broken And picking up fragments of myself I'll glue them back together So I can stand at the edge of this world and yell That my heart breaks one thousand times a day for every hope that dies, another one takes its place Because I have the strength of a mountain 
And now we've got the courage of the deep blue sea And now I have the heart of a lion And the stars burn bright inside of me And although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see That I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me Dust the cobwebs off this sheath And I'll take the sword of my belief And in this storm I will not flinch And I will not move No, not an inch I have the strength of a mountain I've got the courage of the deep blue sea And I'll have the heart of a lion And the stars, they burn bright inside of me But although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see? I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me I like that song. I like that song a lot. Um, it reminds me of the, the, the last verse of High Ren. That, that, that song is just... Is, is the last verse of High Ren. It's just rewritten. And, but, I mean, it's just it's a great song. Um, but, uh, yeah. Don't give up, guys. Don't give up. Um, we can... Uh, I think, I think we, we can beat this thing. Um, but, uh, he looks so young in that video, um, and, uh, God, I'm just jealous of his, of his, uh, guitar skills. Um, I really, really wish I could figure out how to, how to play. Um, I wanted to take lessons, but. The, the music place that's near me closed down. Um, and uh, there was a guy I knew uh, that played bass, that, uh, but they, they weren't interested in teaching anything. But, um, and uh, I've got, uh, I've got several, I've got several bass guitars that I'm, I'm not proficient on any of them. Um, and, I, and I have a guitar kit um that i'm very lazy on on starting but it was on sale um after christmas so i, I bought it um so i could learn how to play guitar like ren it's never gonna happen but um anyway guys thanks for uh thanks for uh thanks for sitting through this if you did i highly doubt you did but um um that's it man later Go do something important.